Okay, fantastic. Uh, I once again want to start off doing the most important part, which is thanking the people who did the work here. I'm going to tell you uh, about um, stories in which research was done by Glennis Rehrman, Scott Rehrman, and Caitlin Cornell in my laboratory, and with fantastic collaborators, with Alex Mers, Shushan, Ilya, Candice, Allison, and huge thanks to Linda Wardeman and Josh Vaughn for lending us expertise and their instrumentation, and also Liz, Dan, Rachel, Tyler, Marco, Lauren, Aaron, and from funding from the NSF and the NIH. And throughout, I'll also try and, and highlight people as well, but I wanted to make sure that I did that most important thing first. Okay, let's think about sizes and when do we discover big sizes versus small sizes and do we expect that? Okay, we've seen this movie now, here's the third time. And now we're seeing this case in which the domains start out small, but that's not how they end up, right? As, as time goes on, those domains grow larger and larger until they're finally in a taut membrane going to end up that they have only one bright domain and one dark domain. And now, what are the exceptions to that rule? Whoop. Go forward. One exception is when those individual domains are bulging out of the membrane. And that can create an activation energy against those domains coalescing. In my laboratory, we've seen domains that bulge out. Other laboratories have seen domains that bulge out or bulge in. And a reason that those can be prevented from coalescing is because there's excess area in the membrane. And that excess area makes it so that a membrane that's between two bulges. So here's a bulge on the left in a bright bulge on the right that is also bright. And the membrane that is in between acts like a spring. So as those two bulges are coming close to each other, the membrane that's in the middle acts like a spring and prevents those two domains from merging. In beautiful work by Tristan Nursell and Bill Klug and Rob Phillips. Okay, now we could ask, what about systems that are more biological? Many other groups are experts in looking at giant plasma membrane vesicles, and those individual vesicles are blebbed off of a cell membrane, so they're cell-derived. This means that they have a huge diversity of lipids. Um, they also have an extraordinary diversity of the proteins. So the proteins that were still attached to the cytoskeleton are back where they used to be. The, the membrane is maintaining most of its asymmetry, and that also shows only two coexisting phases. But there's always been some skepticism. What about in an unperturbed cell membrane? That giant plasma membrane vesicle was, was slightly perturbed. And as much as I want to say that it is absolutely biological, there's always been some pushback about what happens in an unperturbed cell membrane. And so here are the superstars of this particular story. And I want to tell you the story of, of why there's been some pushback in the, the community. And the idea has been that when you think about a cell membrane, that, and that only thinking about that outer plasma membrane of a resting unperturbed cell and presumably other cell membranes, that it's not uniform. And if it is not uniform, it's, it's not uniform on micron scales, but rather that there are rafts or platforms. And a problem has been that when and if these domains exist, they're too small to image by conventional microscopy, and that's led some skepticism about results in the field. So is there a case in which we can see very large domains in a membrane? And I'm going to tell you yes, and the answer is in yeast. Yeast um, grow. So if we put some yeast in new culture at time zero, this is a log normal plot. Time is on the x-axis. Optical density, which is a measure of how many cells are in the system, is on the y-axis in in a log scale. And that means when we have exponential growth, then we should see a straight line over here for that exponential growth. The biology community calls this the log stage of growth. And then when the yeast run out of glucose, they enter a stationary stage of growth. So it gets a little confusing because it says phase, uh, right? That's different than phase separation, it's phase of growth. All right. I'm going to tell you a story about the yeast vacuole. And the vacuole is a lysosomal organelle. It does a lot of different things. 
Um, and when the yeast enters that stationary stage of growth, that vacuole, uh, initially there are a lot of little vacuoles, and that vacuole, they all merge and they become huge. They take up a, a very large fraction of the size of that cell. So you can think of it like Alice, who has become huge in that room. And she's not only huge, she's covered in polka dots. And here's what that looks like in real data. This is a paper from Alexander Tolme and Will Prince. And this is what got me really excited about the field is I, uh, about this project is that I saw this image. They have, let's look, start over on the right-hand side. Here's a case where there's a vacuole inside of a living cell and it contains only one domain on its membrane. Um, there are also cases in which there are a few domains. There are also cases in which there are several domains. Here you can really start to see that the membrane that's in between is bulging into the membrane, into the vacuole. They saw this with 14 different protein markers, three different lipid probes. It didn't matter how they labeled it, they got the same results. So to me, to my eyes, this looks like phase separation. And a question is always, if it looks like phase separation, but is it really phase separation? Now, I want to say that uh, this observation of domains and membranes was not new. Um, here's results back from 1979. This is freeze fracture electron microscopy of the vacuole membrane. Starting on, on the left-hand side, there's the log phase, and then the middle has the stationary stage of that growth. And you can see that there are cases in what we're looking at, those little stipple marks are places where there are big protein complexes. And a pleasure of doing this online is that like usually when we're looking at a screen, you can say, oh, it looks so much better on my screen. So I'm hoping that you can see it in all of its beautiful glory on your screens as well. These little stipple marks of these protein complexes are excluded from these regions in the middle, which we've shaded on the right to help you see them better. Um, the same sort of work has been done more recently in a beautiful paper by Tsuji et al. And now you can really see those domains bulging into the vacuole when it's in the stationary stage versus a uniform log stage vacuole. Okay, I have a really simple physics question. Uh, and that is, is this phase separation? And is what kind of phase separation is it? If it's liquid-liquid phase separation, then we should see coalescence on short time scales. If it is phase separation, we should see it's reversible with a single thermodynamic parameter. Our favorite thermodynamic parameter is temperature. And we're gonna do all of our experiments in this stationary stage of growth where there are domains. I'd like to emphasize that every picture that I'm going to show you is of a vacuole that's inside of a living cell. So the pictures I'm gonna show you are like this one at the left where the vacuole itself has is labeled, but every single time if we were to also do differential interference contrast microscopy, we would see the entire cell. Okay, here's our experiment. On the x-axis is time. On the y-axis is temperature. The experiment starts at a low temperature. The yeast are grown at 30 degrees. And at that low temperature, in the stationary stage of growth, they have domains. So here's one vacuole, and it has a big dark domain. It's kind of like a Pac-Man with its mouth down. And when we increase temperature, it goes away. And even better, it comes back, goes away, comes back, goes away, comes back. So it's reversible. And that transition occurs at the same temperature every single time. Now we'd like to ask the question of um, whether that harmed the cell and it turns out cell viability is not affected by those brief excursions up to 40 degrees. Um, the next thing that we'd like to think about is the coalescence. How long does it take for domains to coalesce? This is a harder experiment because it requires starting out with those domains that are bulged. So we need to prod that cell to uh, get it over that hump of those domains coalescing. And here's a movie of doing exactly that. Let's see if that movie plays. Hmm. Hello, curse. Oh, there we go. I think it should loop. What the arrow should be pointing at, right? Oh, no, it didn't loop. Right here. Whoop. Mine froze. Hold on a second. 
I know movies can be difficult on, uh, okay, let me go back a slide. Okay, what that arrow is pointing to is a bright division between two individual domains. And the two dark domains on either side of it throughout this movie will coalesce quickly. There'll be kind of an, a figure eight, and then there'll be an O shape. And if you look at the domain that's to the side of it, right now, that domain is a hexagon. And by the end of the movie, it will be a pentagon. So that says that everything in that system is liquid. And... Oh. And I'm hoping you can see that movie. If not, it's, it's in the supplemental for the paper that's referenced down on the bottom right-hand side. All right, the conclusion is that cells use all the tools at their disposal, physics and chemistry. They don't know that there's a difference between the departments in their toolbox to produce changes in their membrane. This is really nice for the physics community. Like this is what we would like to think. Uh, and it was written up by Physics Today, which was really nice. It's also a big deal for the cell biologists. So there are two different groups, that of Chao Wen Wang and Jennifer Lippincott Schwartz. And they have evidence that these domains play a role in the docking of lipid droplets. Lipid droplets are, you can think of them as fuel packets. They contain uh, neutral lipids that that cell is going to put inside of its vacuole to then use uh, as, as fuel for when there's glucose again in the system. So that's a reason why you might like to have domains in that membrane. Another reason you might, like to have domains in that membrane is to control autophagy. So there are, if we think about the, the end point, autophagy means uh, self-eating. So the cell needs to do that in order to, um, to store its fuel within its vacuole. So if the end point is autophagy, then we can start going backward to get autophagy, we need to reduce signaling for through the, the TOR signaling. For that to happen, we need to adjust some parameters before that of proteins that affect how that signaling process goes. And the groups of Will Prince and Jody Nunari showed that all of that, the protein fragments from all of these different important players are in the same domain and they hypothesize that that proximity turns off one of those negative regulators allowing autophagy to increase downstream. Okay, part two of this talk is to think about small domains in model membranes. And I made the point previously that one way that you could get domains from being as big as they might possibly be is to have uh, an activation energy for coalescence. But that doesn't really explain how he might get stripes. Hmm, so very beautiful and somewhat confusing. How might you get stripes? Uh, to think about how you might get stripes, the thing to do is to look in the literature, but there is really, for me, an avalanche of literature in the field. Uh, you can break down the literature into a few different categories. Um, those that pertain to stripes, I've outlined in blue, those that pertain to dots, I've outlined it red. Um, there are some that for reasons I'm not gonna get into, we already know are not the case and I've grayed those out. Um, and the ones that pertain to stripes and dots are the ones I'm gonna tell you about today, number three and number four. And the broad class of these different theories, think about coupling the local composition of the membranes, what's the fraction of each lipid in a particular part of the membrane that is curved versus curved one way versus curved a different way. And another class of theories thinks about a balance of interfaces, uh, the cost of an interface with repulsion from a lipid dipole. So let me attack this first one. To be able to think about these theories, uh, we can measure in the laboratory, we can think about what experimental knobs we can turn in the laboratory. We can adjust temperature and tension and the ratio of lipids and the type of lipids. I think this is a great idea because I'm an experimentalist, but unfortunately, few existing theories make predictions in terms of these variables that we can measure in experiments, but nevertheless, let's see how far we can get. First, let's change temperature. What we find is that the temperature, increasing temperature decreases the stripe width. That's entirely expected. The interface costs energy. Unfortunately, it doesn't 
make any distinction between any of the theories. Now let's think about tension in the membrane. So if we pull on the membrane by uh, changing the osmotic pressure on the inside versus the outside of the vesicle. And what we end up seeing is that as we pull on the membrane, we add more tension, then the stripe width increases. And that's pretty exciting because Michael Schick wrote in a paper in uh, the Journal of Physical Chemistry B that if one increases the surface tension of the membrane, making it more taut as we did, then the characteristic width decreases. And the opportunity to, to possibly show that Michael Schick might've been wrong comes along rarely, pretty exciting. Uh, and so we showed it to Michael and he said, ah, yes, but, that theory was in the case in which the tension is initially low in the membrane. I suspect it's the case that tension is initially high in your membrane in which you'd get the opposite result. Oh, so he would have been happy either way. Um, there's a separate theory by Jim Harden, Fred McIntosh, Peter Olmsted, and they say that increasing tension increases strike width. So now we have another case in which it's consistent. Our observation is consistent with all theories that address it so far. Next, let's think if there's any other way to distinguish those two theories. Well, um, Michael Schick's theory is one of a microemulsion, and the other theory is one of, um, of a modulated phase. And those two different theories differ in terms of how fast there's a decay of that order. So on the x-axis here is distance, on the y-axis is a correlation, and the decay should be faster in one case than the other case. So let's look at our data. We get a bunch of stripes and uh, we can do a, a one, these stripes happen to be um, almost aligned, aligned, aligned in, in correlation of that. And we don't see any difference within experimental uncertainty between these two theories. So I can't say whether it's a microemulsion or a modulated phase. Okay, so, so far it's consistent with everything that, that addresses it. Now let's think about the ratio of the lipids. So what we're going to do is measure how changes in the ratio of the lipids alter the fluorescence levels and separately, we're gonna see whether those changing ratios gets us dots or stripes. The first test is to address Michael Schick's theory. Michael Schick posited that membrane areas with stripes contain anti-registered domains. And we can test that because it turns out that when those stripes show up, they initially show up at the interface between a phase separated system. So if we add stripes, in here that have that anti-registration. And if our dye prefers one of those regions versus the other, then what we'll end up seeing is that on the left, we have a double dark membrane. In the middle, we have a bright dark, a bright dark. And then on the right-hand side, we have a double bright membrane. And when we look in a microscope, we should expect to see three fluorescence levels. We actually see two, so not consistent. Um, with that. Another is whether we see dots or stripes. And in that case, we can go from a place that's close to a critical point to a place that's further away from the critical point. So we know how to adjust line tension in this case. Uh, what we see is a transition from stripes to dots, and that disagrees with a prediction by Jim and Fred and Peter. Um, albeit they, they had a, a particular parameter set for their for their model. All right, so to conclude, what do we find so far? Temperature says it's consistent with all theories. Tension says it's consistent with all theories. The ratio of lipids says it's inconsistent with all theories that discuss it. Um, so now let's think about the types of lipids. The types of lipids relate to this uh, number four, balancing the cost of an interface with repulsion from lipid dipoles. and. Here, I, I get confused when I think about lipid dipoles in terms of a bilayer, bilayer scenario. So you should really more think of a quadrupole in that case. Um, and now there's a question of that quadrupole is, is now surrounded by water. When you think of its dielectric constant, it's hard to imagine how you get enough of an effect. 
these authors said, aha, you should be able to get a high enough effect by having that dipole be down in a, a dielectric constant that is in a dielectric medium that represents the middle of that bilayer. For example, if you have the case that the dipole is due to the ester linkage of the lipids. And for those of you who are not familiar with uh, lipid structures, let me draw you a picture so you know what I'm talking about. Here we have some ester linkages on our lipid. So in this case, our, our lipid is laying on its side with its head group on the right, the oily tails on the left, and here are the ester linkages. And thank goodness, Avanti polar lipids sells ether-linked lipids that take off that ester linkage, that place where that dipole has been hypothesized to uh, show up. And we still get small scale domains. So domains that have small length scale. So that small length scale can't be due to the ester linkage. Let's review. What have we got? Temperature says it's consistent with everything. Tension is consistent with all theories that describe it, but the ratio of lipids is inconsistent with all theories that, uh, that describe that. And the, when we think about the types of lipid, it's, it's also inconsistent with the assertion that dots and stripes are due to the dipoles at the ester linkages. Whew. How should we think about this? Those broad classes of uh, imagining that there's a balance of forces or that the lipid composition is coupled with the curvature. Those are, those are great ideas. And, and I feel like one of those must be correct. But of course the devil's in the details about how the individual, uh, the assumptions in each particular theory. At, to date, no single theory currently explains all of our observations. So how should you think about that? one way is to be pessimistic about it and say, ah, oh, we have little theory to explain our data. I think for the trainees who are watching, I want to be optimistic and say that the field is wide open for new theories and for modified theories in this system, right? You, you might have been overwhelmed by the amount of literature in the system, in, in, in this field, and think that what, what could my contribution be that there are clearly places in which your contribution is absolutely needed in this system. And with that, I, I think I'm ready to take questions. Okay, okay great, that sounds good. Should I stop um, sharing? Thanks, Sarah. So, um, I think you can keep that up because some of the questions might get at some of your data, okay. but I'd like to start with one of the questions from the tutorial we didn't have time mm -hmm. for, um, from, from Indy Badvaram, who asked, um, if the maximal domain size relative to the vesicle size varies significantly for different types of lipids. Ooh. It, it seems like it must vary with composition, yes. right? So it varies. Remember the, the tie line lesson about where the fulcrum is. So if that fulcrum is right in the middle of the tie line, then that means that we'll end up with the same mole fraction of, of the bright phase versus the dark phase. Um, but if we're at one end, if the fulcrum's at one end versus the other, then we'll end up with bright domains on a dark background or dark domains on a bright background. Um, now, the way that, that the type of lipid ends up affecting things is that the type of lipid affects the overall shape of the phase diagram. So it may be the case that swapping out one type of lipid for another type of lipid um, is changing uh, where that, if we think about the phase diagram, um, if we're looking down on one of those ternary phase diagrams as, as like flying over a mountain, then it can change the, the height of the, and the width of that mountain. Great. Uh, so, so next I'd like to go to a great question from Jing Chen, um, and I think a big one about why when you have N lipids, do you only have two phases? <laughs> oh. um, and <laughs> yeah, but, but here's a couple, uh, let me elaborate on that from what Jing Chen said. Is it because that seems to be a most energetically favorable mode of separation that outcompetes other mo modes? Or is it possible that there really are more than domains, right? Do we know that the different domains all have the same composition? 
Does that make sense? Uh, right, right, right. Okay. Yes, absolutely. So the even in systems that are cell derived in those giant plasma membrane vesicles, um, and in the the yeast vacuole system. Remember how in that yeast vacuole system you saw the same behavior when you labeled with uh, many different endogenous proteins and many different lipid types. Those kinds of experiments have been done by several different people in the field. Uh, a, a nice work is, is by Sarah Veet, if you want to have a good jumping off point for that. And they have labeled those uh, giant plasma membrane vesicles with many different lipid types or with many different protein markers and always seen that there are only two phases. So that would imply that those, those, the compositions are the same uh, for those two phases. It's not that there are unseen phases there that, that we're not seeing. Now that said, of course, these experiments are done by fluorescence microscopy. Um, I'm, everything I'm telling you about is for a large domain. And then the, any thoughts on the bigger question of why just two phases? Oh, um, well, I mean, I, I take solace in the, the Gibbs phase rule that says, the Gibbs phase rule says you're not required to have more phases. You only, uh, have the opportunity to have more phases. I guess, you know, this is, my intuition, and now my intuition has been often wrong, so you know, take this all with a grain of salt, is that what really drives phase separation in this system is the phospholipids, is the difference in the phospholipids. So there needs to be a high melting temperature lipid and a low melting temperature lipid, and uh, the, the um, absolute value doesn't matter, but you, you do need an offset between the two. If you had no cholesterol in the system, then you would end up with a phase separation that would be a solid liquid coexistence. Adding the cholesterol converts that solid into a liquid. And so even if you add more lipid types, they'll still fall into this rubric of some of them are higher melting temperature and some of them are lower melting temperature. Um, so that's the way that I end up thinking about it, but I'm looking forward to someone proving that wrong. I, th I think that there's, still the opportunity to find new things. Okay, great, thanks. Um, another question from Santosh Adhikari about the yeast experiments. Have you looked at what happens to the domains in the vacuole when the stationary phase yeast cells are refed with glucose? We haven't, but others have. For example, that, that Tolme and Prince paper is gorgeous. And one of the experiments that they did was exactly that. If you start feeding the yeast glucose again, then the domains go away. Okay. Um, let me just check how we are in time. I think we have time for one more before we go to the informal Q&A. So Dylan Steer asked um, how much of the possible domain, domain formation in the vacuole and plasma membrane um, is, is active versus passive. Um, so that's one part of the question. And the other part is um, what what allows cells to be viable near or above the phase transition temperature if this causes such a large change in the domain equilibrium and kinetics, right? Like, would you work, would you, yeah, like, are the, the, does that perturbation that causes the deep mixing affect their ability to survive? From what we've seen, um, so I, the first question was, is it active or passive? And I, I think that maybe when, you have to tell me if I'm incorrect. One way of asking that is, is energy going into the system for that transition to occur or not? And because we can see that on fast time scales by changing temperature, I tend to think about it as phase separation in the same way that I think about phase separation in a model membrane, even though it's in a vacuole. And I think that I'm allowed to get away with that only if there's a big separation in time scales. So um, we are going across that transition and back again on the order of, of seconds. And the machinery that would be needed in order to, um, to produce new proteins, for example, or to produce a different lipid type to make that transition go um, is much longer. Now, of course, that's what the cell will do, the cell goes across that transition by changing the composition of its membrane. But in our experiments, in which we're changing temperature quickly, um, we've done that quickly on purpose to be far away from the time scales that would be relevant in the cell. 
the second question was uh, if we have a, a self for a long period of time. Can you repeat it? I'm sorry, Meredith. It was, it was about sort of viability and the te with the temperature change. And do you worry that the, the big change in what's going on in the vacuole membranes with the demixing could affect the cell's ability to survive? Right. OK, so we measured that, luckily. Um, when we are doing our experiments, we are taking them in short excursions up to high temperature. Yeast don't like to live for a long period of time at high temperature. So we were careful to, after we had tort, we took two separate, uh, we took one batch of lipid, of vacuoles of the yeast and separated into two samples. One of those samples we tortured by taking them up and down in, in temperature sweeps, and the other one we didn't, and then we grew them up again and found out that the cell bi viability was unaffected in that case. Now, if one were to take those yeast and put them at a high temperature for a very long period of time, then I would expect their viability to be different. Affected. Okay, great, thank you. So, um, so we're at the top of the hour now, so I'm going to go ahead and stop the formal discussion um, and stop the recording.